A common phrase that suggests a better future and a better you is recreating yourself. But how many really understand how deep it goes? How many people really start on this life-changing journey? We are on the edge of the year 2024, so it's time for a deep waking. A comprehensive guide to recreating yourself in 2024 is provided here. The Stoic philosophy, as well as that of other interesting philosophers, is used in this video. Imagine a life where other people's opinions don't affect you, and the noise of society doesn't matter. The art of not caring is what we'll talk about first. It's not about boredom, it's about freedom, where you become the center of your own world and don't care about what's going on around you. In this world, people don't try to be happy, it's just there, ready to be realized. But if you really don't care about what's outside, you have to look inside. The art of selfishness is discussed here. Before you get angry at the word selfish, think about this. Can you really love other people if you haven't loved yourself? Learn why selfishness and self-love are the basis of a good life. Now that you have a stronger sense of who you are, let's talk about one of the deepest human quests, finding your own sense of purpose in a world full of chaos. An anchoring purpose can help you see the way. It's not about finding meaning, it's about making it, making a life so full that every breath is a reflection of who you are. The last part of our trip is Stoicism, an old philosophy that is still very useful today. Learn about the Stoic's idea of the good life, which is defined by virtue, wisdom and tranquility rather than by financial success. A life in which adversity changes you rather than breaking you. As you start a new year, Remember that exercise isn't about changing how you look, but about changing who you are at your heart. It's about finding the gems that are hidden inside you, getting back in touch with your true self, and then sending that energy out into the world. The year 2024 is coming up, and it looks like a clean start. The real question is not whether you should change, but whether you are ready to meet your best self. Don't be afraid to jump in, Let's go on a trip together to reach unmatched growth, wisdom, and enlightenment. Have you ever felt like society's demands were too much for you to handle or worry about things you couldn't change? You're not the only one if you said yes. A lot of us spend our whole lives worrying about things that may not be as important as we think they are. But what if there was a way to get out of this stuck state? A way to get through life with less stress and more peace of mind? Today, we're going to learn more about a philosophical approach that could help you live a happier, more fulfilling life. The art of not caring. This approach isn't about ignoring or not caring about other people. It's about putting our care and attention where it matters, on things we can control, and letting go of the rest. This video will take you on a trip through the wisdom of different ideologies and the philosophers who have been here before us, and left us clues. This look at different religions and their ideas isn't just for school. It includes the calming philosophy of Buddhism, the energizing philosophy of Stoicism, the existential courage of Søren Kierkegaard, the hedonic calculus of Epicurus, the life-affirming ideas of Taoism, and the individualistic essence of existentialism. We'll also talk about cases and uses from real life, the way these ideas have been used by real people will be discussed, along with how not worrying in the right way can lead to more happiness, less fear, and a more complete life in general. But what do we really mean when we say not caring in a philosophical sense? Not caring doesn't mean being completely detached or not caring at all. It means freeing ourselves from social pressures, fears of the unknown, worries about things we can't control, and stress over what other people will think of us. It is better to focus on what we do, how we react, and how we feel instead of worrying about things we can't change. This is called the art of not caring. Understanding our limits and choosing what deserves our attention, hard work, and enthusiasm is what it's all about. 
It's about learning to be okay with not knowing what will happen and relishing the present moment with joy. You've come to the right place if you've ever felt like the world was weighing on your shoulders, or if you've ever wished you could let go of worries that are holding you back, or if you're just interested in learning about different philosophical views on happiness. We hope that by the end of this trip, you'll have a new understanding of how to handle the ups and downs of life with calmness, peace, and a clear mind. Join us as we show you how to free yourself by learning the art of not caring. Now is the time to go on a philosophical trip to learn more about yourself and how to let go so that you can live a happier, more satisfying life. Before we start this journey, it's important to set the scene by looking into the deep connection between philosophy and happiness. How does philosophy help us define and understand what happiness is? Philosophy is the pursuit of knowledge and the love of wisdom. It looks into basic questions about being, reality, information, values, reason, and most importantly, for our talk today, happiness. Many philosophers from different times and places have tried to answer the question of what happiness is and how to get it. From old Greek philosophers to modern thinkers, the main goal of philosophical study has always been to find the means of happiness. On the surface, the idea of happiness seems easy and applies to everyone. But when you look closer, you find that it has many aspects and is very personal and complicated. What makes us happy is mainly based on our own experiences, our culture and what other people expect of us. But the meaning of happiness grows and changes when we look at it through the big picture of philosophy instead of a particular view. So, how do different intellectual views see happiness? First, let's talk about the Greeks. One of the most important philosophers of all time, Aristotle, thought that happiness was more than just a feeling or a short-lived state of joy. He came up with the idea of eudaimonia, which is often translated as well-being or the good life. Aristotle believed that happiness consisted of living a life of virtue and wisdom, reaching one's full potential and making a positive difference in the world. It wasn't about seeking pleasure. It was about making your inner life full. Epicurus, on the other hand, thought that happiness meant seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Epicurean philosophy, on the other hand, doesn't support selfish excess. Epicurus stressed the easy, natural joys of life, such as peace of mind, friendship, and intellectual activities. These philosophers, like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, were utilitarian. They lived in the 17th and 18th centuries, during the Age of Enlightenment. They said that happiness is about making as many people as possible happy. This idea formed the base of their moral and ethical standards. Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher who lived in the 1800s, had a less positive view. He thought that life was full of pain and that happiness was just not having to go through pain. Schopenhauer's philosophy says that we should lessen our wants in order to feel less pain and sadness. This changes the way we think about what happiness is. Then there were the existentialists of the 20th century, such as Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. They thought that life has no meaning by itself and that it's up to each person to find their own happiness and purpose. They didn't agree with social rules and pushed for sincerity and personal freedom. Also, we can't forget Eastern philosophy practices like Buddhism. Buddhism says that the way to happiness is to let go of desire and attachment, which leads to inner peace and enlightenment. These different philosophical points of view make it clear that happiness isn't an idea that works for everyone. That which we believe, the decisions we make, and how we see the world are all deeply connected to it. To be happy, people follow different beliefs. Some seek virtue, others pleasure, still others freedom, or still others spiritual growth. 
we will look at how letting go of some worries fits in with these different philosophical views on happiness as we talk about the art of not caring today. The goal is to find a balanced and careful way to care about the things that matter to us, which will lead us to a happy and satisfying life. It's important to remember that philosophy doesn't give us solutions. It helps us figure out what questions to ask. As we learn more about how to not care, let's keep an open mind, question what we think we know, and let these different philosophical ideas help us understand what happiness is. Let's set out on this fascinating journey, learning from the deep insights into happiness of great philosophers. Now, let's talk about Stoicism and old Greek philosophy, which has become famous again recently because it has deep wisdom and useful advice for living a good life. Zeno of Sidium started Stoicism in Athens in the early 3rd century BC. However, it was the later Stoic philosophers, such as Epicurus, Seneca, and Marcus Aelius, whose ideas have stood the test of time and still speak to us today. Self-discipline, virtue, and reason are important in the ethical philosophy of Stoicism. It shows us that we can't change what happens to us, but we can change how we react to it. Stoicism tells us to focus on what we can control and let go of what we can't. It's a strong way to learn how to not care. This leads us to the Stoic idea of the two kinds of power. Epicurus, a scholar who used to be a slave, wrote beautifully about this idea in his Enchiridion, or Guide. He said, Some things are within our power, while others are not within our power. Our opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and, in a word, whatever is of our own doing, are within our power. Not within our power are our body, our property, reputation, office, and, in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. This strong contrast tells us to focus our attention, energy, and feelings on the parts of our lives that we can manage and to act like we don't care about the rest. This doesn't mean we should be lazy or ignore our tasks. Instead, it means we should figure out what's really important and deserves our attention and care. It's about deciding not to be upset by the things we can't change in life. This helps us keep our peace of mind and align ourselves with the natural order of the world, which is a central Stoic idea. Stoicism's example of the skill of not caring can be seen in Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. As Roman Emperor, Marcus Aurelius had a lot of power and influence, but his works show that he knew that these things are temporary. As he put it in writing, very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. He often stressed the value of inner peace and tranquility over external accomplishments or praise, showing the stoic way of not caring about things we can't change. In his writings, Seneca, another important stoic writer, gives more examples of this idea. He taught us not to be overly affected by adversity or overly ecstatic about success and to stay unaffected by external circumstances. In a message he wrote, True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future, not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient, for he that is so wants nothing. By following Stoic principles, we learn not to worry about how our lives are changing all the time and instead focus on improving our character, wisdom and virtue. We learn to be happy with what we have, not caring about what other people do, and at peace with the world. Not caring about anything in the Stoic sense is not the same thing as being indifferent to it. Instead, it means knowing where to focus our care and attention for a happy and peaceful life. From the Stoic school of thought, we now go to Epicurus's garden. Epicurus, a Greek philosopher from antiquity who established the Epicureanism school of philosophy, has another viewpoint on the art of not caring. Despite what many people think, 
Epicureanism is not about enjoying physical joys or living a fancy life. It's about living a life of tranquility, freedom, and friendship, not about knowing the nature of pleasure and desire. Epicurus said that joy is the best thing in the world and the point of life, but he also said that not all pleasures are worth seeking. He made a distinction between kinetic pleasures, which come from gratifying a desire, and catastatic pleasures, which come from a state of contentment when we are not experiencing pain or desires. Epicurus said that the best life is one in which we can stay in a state of catastatic happiness and enjoy the simple things in life without being pushed by desires all the time. What Epicureanism says about social standards and material wants is an important part of the art of not caring. Epicurus wanted people to live a simple life away from the busy life of Athens. He thought that a lot of our wants, like wanting money, fame, or power, come from what other people expect of us and aren't normal or important. Epicurus said that these wants often cause more harm than good because they are never-ending and keep us wanting more. Epicurus famously said, If you want to make a man happy, don't add to his riches, take away from his desires. Epicurus's ideas about fear, especially the fear of death, are also very interesting. He said death doesn't matter to us because death doesn't exist when we don't, and we don't exist when death does. Epicurus says that we shouldn't be afraid of death because it's a necessary part of life. This way, we can live more freely and happily in the present. So how do these ideas make your life better? We can achieve a state of contentment and inner peace by knowing the nature of our desires, telling them apart from those that aren't important, and learning how to control them well. By choosing not to care about what other people think, or the fear of death, we free ourselves from worries and stresses that aren't necessary. This makes room for real joy and tranquility. Epicureanism teaches us that happiness doesn't come from having things or being important, but from being at peace inside, without any pain or trouble. The philosophy teaches us to enjoy the easy things in life, like friendship, thought, and not having to worry about what other people want or fear. It also teaches us how to not care about other people. The Epicurean way of life tells us to rethink our wants and values, to let go of social expectations and pointless fears, and to enjoy life's simple, long-lasting pleasures. Let's keep these ideas from Epicurus with us as we go on our trip. Let's value the part that pleasure and desire play in our lives and stop worrying about things that don't make us happy in the long run. As we continue our philosophical study of the art of not caring, we visit Denmark in the 1800s and meet Søren Kierkegaard, who is generally seen as the founder of existentialism. Unlike the other philosophers we've talked about so far, Kierkegaard lived in a very different time and culture. Kierkegaard's existential philosophy is all about the person, their feelings, their freedom, their choices, and their subjective life. He thought that everyone has their own idea of what is true, and that everyone has to figure out how to live their own life on their own. His works give us a deep look into the mind of a person by exploring worry, hopelessness, and the search for meaning. The leap of faith in the face of life's riddles and unknowns is one of Kierkegaard's most well-known ideas. In order to find purpose and get over depression, according to Kierkegaard, one must take a leap of faith into religion. While the phrase leap of faith is often used in religious contexts, especially in Kierkegaard's works, the idea behind it goes beyond religion. It's about embracing ambiguity and having the guts to make choices without knowing exactly how things will turn out. Fear and worry that we feel every day come from not knowing what will happen. We worry about what might happen in the future and find it hard to make choices when we can't see what will happen. What if, though, we decide not to care about this chance? What if we take that leap of faith, know that we don't know what will happen, 
and make our decisions with guts and conviction. Kierkegaard said, Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. This quote fits with what we're talking about because it reminds us that we can learn from our mistakes and gain wisdom from them, but we can't know or control what will happen in the future. So, deciding not to worry about what might happen in the future doesn't mean you're careless or don't care what happens. Instead, it's about getting rid of our crippling fear of the unknown so that we can fully live in the moment and do what we believe is right. By freeing us from the weight of worry and fear, Kierkegaard's leap of faith could lead us to greater happiness. When we stop worrying too much about what might happen, we can focus on the here and now and do things that are in line with our values. We free ourselves to live an honest life without being constantly worried about what might happen in the future when we do this. Kierkegaard's psychological philosophy makes us think deeply about our own lives, our worries, and our freedom. His idea of the leap of faith gives us a way to deal with the unknowns in life, not by trying to guess or control the future, but by embracing these unknowns with confidence and focusing on who we really are. We should be brave and care less about the things we can't change in life and more about living fully and honestly in the present. From the bussy streets of Denmark in the 1800s, our intellectual journey takes us to ancient India, where Siddhartha Gautama, better known as the Buddha, created Buddhism, a deep philosophy and way to spiritual awakening. Buddhism is a non-theistic religion that has a special view on happiness, pain, detachment, and how to stop worrying about things that are temporary and will not last. Buddhism has a different idea of what happiness is than many Western schools of thought. Buddhism doesn't think of happiness as pleasure or getting what you want. Instead, it sees real happiness as a deep, long-lasting state of well-being and contentment that comes from inner peace and wisdom. This happiness isn't affected by outside factors, and anyone can get it by being aware, acting in an honest way, and knowing how reality works. The Four Noble Truths are very important to Buddhism. They explain what pain is, why it happens, how to stop it, and the way to do that. According to what the Buddha taught, pain comes from tanha, which means a strong desire for something other or more than what is. We want these things because we don't know that reality is really made up of changeable things. Dissatisfaction and not-self lead us to the Buddhist ideals of detachment and non-attachment, which are very important for knowing how to not care from a Buddhist point of view. In Buddhism, detachment doesn't mean ignoring or avoiding life's events. Instead, it means having a deep knowledge of and acceptance of the fact that everything changes. It means letting go of people, things, events, and even ideas, because you know they can change and disappear. Not being attached to things, events, or ideas is the same thing as being detached. It means not having to hold on to them all the time. We can fully experience life as it happens when we practice non-attachment. We can feel joy, sadness, happiness, and pain without being controlled by these fleeting emotions. We learn to really care about life without being tied down by it. We are not rejecting or devaluing things that change or disappear when we don't care about them. Instead, we are learning to connect to them in a better way, fully feeling and enjoying them while they last, but not suffering when they change or disappear. When you apply this way of thinking to your life, you can find deep peace and happiness inside. It helps us enjoy the beauty of the seasons without getting caught up in the storm of desire, dislike, or fantasy. It's said that you only lose what you cling to. This simple but profound saying sums up the core of Buddhist detachment and non-attachment. It tells us to let go and stop worrying too much about things that are temporary and hard to understand. By doing this, we remove ourselves from a lot of the pain we cause ourselves and make room for a deeper, longer-lasting kind of happiness. 
Buddhist teachings, which go deep into the nature of reality and the mind, can help you learn how to not care. We can learn to live a more peaceful, clear and free life by learning and applying the ideas of detachment and non-attachment. Let us remember the Buddha's wisdom as we continue our search. Remember that everything can change and that if we don't hold on to things that are temporary, we can find inner peace and happiness that lasts. In the end, isn't that what we all want? We are now back in Europe, this time in Germany in the late 1800s, where we meet Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most important and controversial philosophers of all time. Friedrich Nietzsche gave us a strong way to look at the art of not caring. He was famous for his attacks on traditional morals and his philosophy of life affirmation. Nietzsche's philosophy is based on the idea of life reinforcement, which he thought was the best thing about being human. Nietzsche said that to support life is to accept it as it is, with all of its problems, doubts and conflicts. It involves accepting life with a sense of joy, wonder and imagination, rather than in a passive or resigned manner. It's easy to see how Nietzsche's ideas about social rules and the art of not caring fit in with this philosophy of life affirmation. Nietzsche thought that traditional morals and social rules often keep people from living fully and honestly. He didn't like the idea of group morals, which says that good and bad are the same for everyone. Nietzsche thought that not caring about social rules and standard morals wasn't the same as being indifferent or apathetic. He thought that it was about self-overcoming, which is the process of going beyond conditioned behaviors and beliefs to find your own values. When we don't care about what other people think of us, we can start to question, criticize, and finally get rid of these ideas. This lets us write our own moral code and decide for ourselves what is important, useful, and satisfying. This is where the idea of the Übermensch, which is also known as the Overman or Superman, comes up. This idea is Nietzsche's idea of the perfect person, someone who has gotten over themselves, found their values, and accepted life in all its complexity. The Übermensch is the idea that you don't have to care about traditional morality. Instead, you should enjoy life with all of its chaos and confusion and make your own morals. In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche said, I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? These strong words are a call to action. They make us think question and make things. They tell us that we can get through hard times and become the people we really are. In our quest to learn how to not care, what does Nietzsche's philosophy have to offer? It makes us think about how we relate to social rules and traditional morals. As a result, it tells us not to let these outside standards limit who we are, but to instead set our own values and accept life as it is. Let's keep Nietzsche's strong ideas in mind as we continue our research. Let's work on getting over ourselves, be brave enough to make our own standards, and learn to accept life as it is. We've dug deeply into the theoretical realms of the art of not caring as we've traveled through the rich fabric of philosophy, from Stoicism to Buddhism, Nietzsche to Sartre and Camus, etc. Put this academic wisdom into practice now. How can these intellectual lessons help us in our everyday lives? In the real world, what steps can we take? The first thing we need to do is figure out what we really care about. Think about the stoic concept of the two types of control. Sort the things in your life that you can control from the things that you can't. The key is to focus on the things we can change, like our thoughts, feelings and deeds and learn to let go of the things we can't. You can feel a lot less stress and worry by doing this simple thing. This will make room for more joy, freedom, and satisfaction. The second thing we want to talk about is embracing doubt. Life is full of doubts, as Kierkegaard taught us, and trying to control or predict everything is not only pointless, 
but it can also lead to contentment. We can get rid of the fear and worry that come with the unknown by embracing uncertainty and taking that leap of faith. It becomes clear to us that doubt is a chance for growth and change. In the third step, you have to face social standards. We learned from Epicurus, Nietzsche, and existentialism that social rules and standards can make it hard to be ourselves and be happy. Think about the stresses in your own life. Do they match your values and goals, or do they make you feel like you can't be yourself? Not caring about these social standards doesn't mean you're ignoring your duties or not caring about anything. Instead, it's about getting back your freedom to choose your own path, set your own ideals, and make your own character. The fourth step tells us to accept that life is silly. We can recognize the underlying folly and accept it by drawing on Camus' wisdom. Instead of looking for meaning or approval from other people, focus on making your own meaning. This could happen through your hobbies, your job, your relationships, or your own growth. Find joy in the journey, in your Sisyphean battle. Our journey can be helped by these steps, but following them isn't always easy. It takes patience, courage, and self-compassion to go on this journey for a lifetime. Moments of uncertainty, fear, or misunderstanding may occur. Don't forget that it's okay to feel these things. They're normal for people. You should not fight them. Instead, you should recognize them, learn from them, and let them lead you. Now you might be thinking what I can do right now to use these ideas. Mindfulness can help you a lot on this path. To be mindful, you have to be fully present and pay attention to the present moment without judging it. It lets us see our feelings, thoughts and sensations for what they are without getting caught up in them. Take a few moments every day to sit in silence as a simple relaxation method. Pay attention to your breath and how it feels as air comes in and out of your body. Bring your mind back to your breath slowly if it wanders. You can develop a sense of present, acceptance, and non-attachment through this practice. These are all important skills for learning how to not care. Remember that not caring does not mean not caring about or neglecting. It's about figuring out what's important, embracing life's uncertainties and nonsense, and finding your own spirit despite what other people think you should be doing. We need to be brave, kind to ourselves, and ready to accept the whole of what it means to be human on this trip, not the end goal. Now that this look at the art of not caring is over, let's take a moment to think and maybe set the stage for what comes next. We've been on an interesting trip through time, from the Stoic masters of ancient Rome to the existentialist thinkers of the 20th century, looking at how these philosophical schools have thought about the idea of not caring. We've looked at the stoic principle of the split of control, and we've learned that the key to tranquility and happiness lies in figuring out what we can control from what we can't, and putting our attention and energy there. We learned a lot about Epicurean philosophy by looking at what Epicurus said about happiness, desire, and how important it is to not care about what other people think. We put a lot of faith in Kierkegaard, embracing the inevitable uncertainties of life and realizing that not caring about some results can make us happier people. We learned a lot about Eastern philosophy and how the Buddhist ideas of separation and non-attachment can help us let go of things that don't last, which can lead to peace and happiness inside pushed us to question social norms and taught us through his philosophy about valuing life, how important it is to not care about following these norms on our way to overcoming ourselves. Sartre and Camus, in particular, were existentialist philosophers who stressed how silly life is and told us to take responsibility for our own lives, saying that not thinking about how silly life is can lead to personal freedom. In the last part, we talked about how to use these intellectual ideas in everyday life. We talked about how to figure out what's important to us, how to deal with confusion, 
how to go against what society expects of us, and how to accept the ridiculousness of life. We also talked about some problems that might come up along the way, and a simple awareness method that can help you become more present, accepting, and non-attached. However, this discovery is just the start of your trip. The skill of not caring is not a place you can get to, but a way of life that you can follow. It takes self-compassion, patience, and bravery. Remember to apply these philosophical ideas to your own life as you continue to learn more. Figure out what means most to you and let go of what doesn't serve your greatest good. The most important things in life are the lessons we learn, the new ideas we have, and the people we meet. So, go out and learn how to not care about things in your life. See what changes it makes, what freedom it gives you, and what happiness it brings you. Be aware that the path to not caring is not about becoming apathetic or careless. It's about embracing who you are, recovering your freedom, and making your own way. It's about finding your own soul in the midst of societal standards, uncertainty, and the fact that life is just plain silly. At some point, have you ever felt bad about taking the day off, eating your favorite food, or taking a little extra time to care for yourself? Or maybe people have told you you're selfish for putting your own needs first. Now it's time to talk about these feelings and look into the interesting place where self-love and what some might call selfishness meet. We'll take a deep look into the thoughts of some of the most important philosophers and psychologists of all time in this video. These are thinkers who have been brave enough to question the status quo and shed new light on how self-love and selfishness affect our lives. Friedrich Nietzsche, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Aristotle, Ayn Rand, Jean-Paul Sartre, Buddha, and Eric Erikson all had ideas that changed the world. We will find the secret wisdom in what they taught and use what we learn to improve our own lives. Self-love and selfishness are always being sent mixed messages by the world around us. One, the one hand, we're told to be kind and selfless, to put others before ourselves. Though, we are told it's okay to love ourselves and that our own wants should come first. When we get these mixed messages, we might feel lost and guilty, not sure how to find the right balance. You can use what we're talking about today in your personal and business life because of this. To live happier, more peaceful lives, we need to learn more about self-love and selfishness. We can learn to enjoy ourselves with all of our flaws and strengths by setting limits and making time for ourselves. We don't have to feel bad about doing this or worry about being seen as selfish. I used to have a hard time with these very ideas. I would sometimes skip rest, fun, and even health just to keep from being seen as selfish. I would do anything to help other people, even if it meant putting my own health at risk. I didn't understand how important self-love and a certain kind of selfishness are until I started studying philosophy and psychology. These lessons not only changed my personal life, but they also had a big effect on my work life, making me happier and more successful. Therefore, I think this series has something useful to offer you, whether you're here out of interest, in search of personal growth, or to learn things that will help you succeed at work. We'll work together to dispel common myths, see things from different angles, and start a trip to learn more about ourselves and our place in the world. Self-love is more than just going to the spa or eating out at a nice restaurant, though those things can be a part of it. In fact, self-love is a much deeper and more meaningful idea. It's about accepting ourselves fully, flaws and all, it's about recognizing our own worth and being kind and respectful to ourselves. Self-love isn't about being perfect. It's about being okay with how you are. It's about realizing that we're not perfect and that it's okay to mess up. It means showing ourselves the same kindness, understanding and patience that we show to other people. It's not vain or cocky to love yourself. It means recognizing our humanity 
our unique mix of strengths and flaws, and appreciating ourselves just the way we are. You can love yourself by taking care of your physical, social, and mental health. It's about setting limits, taking care of ourselves, following our hobbies, and putting our needs first. It's about taking care of our bodies, keeping our heads active, and keeping our souls healthy. It has nothing to do with selfishness, right? The word selfishness usually has a bad meaning, which gets us to our next word. Most of the time, it's used to describe someone who puts their own needs ahead of others, even if it means hurting them or ignoring their needs. But there is more than one side to this story, as there are to many ideas. When we talk about selfishness in this situation, we're not talking about this harmful, careless behavior. To be more specific, we're talking about a better, healthy kind of selfishness in which we make choices that are good for our own well-being, even if they don't always go along with what other people want. This is the kind of selfishness that lets us say no when we're too busy, follow our dreams, even if they go against social rules, and put ourselves first, even if it seems like a luxury. It's a form of selfishness where we recognize that our own wants are just as important as those of others. Some people think that self-love and selfishness have a confusing relationship, but they really do. So, we have to be a little selfish if we want to really love ourselves. We have to be ready to put our own needs first, set limits, and make decisions that are good for our health. And in order to be positively greedy, we must first see how valuable we are, which means we must love ourselves. Self-love and a good amount of selfishness are like two sides of the same coin. They are both important for our personal growth and happiness. We are able to handle life with resilience, assurance, and inner peace because of the dynamic interaction between self-love and selfishness. But how did these kinds of ideas come about? Where do they fit in the big picture of philosophy and psychological thought? How have they changed over time? As we watch this video, we'll look into these and other questions, looking at them from the interesting points of view of different philosophers and psychologists and finding the deep insights they offer. Remember that this is not meant to promote selfishness in the bad sense, where people don't care about others and hurt them. We want to show you how to have a healthy, balanced sense of self, where you can stand up for your needs, know how valuable you are, and still care about and respect the people around you. We are now going to talk about self-love and healthy selfishness in more detail. These are two ideas that are deeply connected and play key roles in our mental health, personal growth, and general well-being. To understand why loving yourself is so important for mental health, we need to look at biology, psychology, and how people act. There is a direct link between how we see ourselves and our mental health that has been known for decades by psychologists and experts. Let's picture gardens in our heads. Now, you would think that a yard full of love, happiness, and care would grow well. Similarly, our brains can grow when they are filled with self-love. The thorns of self-doubt, self-criticism, and negative self-talk can poison our mental soil and cause anxiety, sadness, and other mental health problems. Self-love is like a natural defense against these things. When we love ourselves, we give our feelings and situations value. We let ourselves feel what we need to, and that our feelings are important. This kind of support can stop people from repressing their emotions, which is often a sign of mental discomfort. Self-love gives us the courage to deal with life's problems head on. We don't have to break down when things get tough or stress us out. Instead, we can stand tall, knowing that we can and should get through these problems. Having this kind of resilience is important for keeping your mental health in good shape and dealing with the ups and downs of life. What does good selfishness have to do with this, though? If self-love is the dirt that our mental garden grows in, then healthy selfishness is the act of taking care of that garden, 
and making sure it gets the food it needs. Healthy selfishness entails recognizing our wants and taking action to satisfy them. Despite our busy lives, it's about making time for ourselves, putting our health first, and not being afraid to set limits. By putting our needs first, we can learn more about ourselves, improve our skills, and follow our hobbies, which leads to personal growth. A good sense of selfishness also helps us learn how to say no, stop trying to please others, and stop taking on too much. A lot of us fall into these traps, and it hurts our mental and emotional health. A crucial step in personal growth is learning to say no to things that drain us. This is an act of healthy selfishness. Self-love and healthy selfishness work together to make a powerful force that helps us live a peaceful, happy, and full life. They help us stay mentally balanced, develop as people, and face the challenges of life with confidence and resilience. We create a mental garden in our minds by loving ourselves, which is a healthy environment for good ideas, self-worth, and resilience. Our healthy selfishness helps us take care of this garden and give it the food, attention, and care it needs to grow. Together, these ideas help us live a life where we can stand tall, not swayed by the winds of outside support or validation, but firmly grounded in self-love and respect. Finally, we can find a balance where we can meet our own wants while also caring about those of others. We'll keep digging deeper into these ideas to find the wisdom they hold as we go. We will learn not only academic knowledge, but also practical, applicable wisdom that can change our lives, guided by the deep insights of philosophers and psychologists who have illuminated the way to self-love and healthy selfishness in their lessons. Let's go down this path with an open mind and a desire to learn. Carl Rogers, a famous and important psychologist who is known as one of the founders of humanistic psychology, is our first stop. Rogers' ideas will always be remembered in this area. Let's go inside his head and find out how he feels about loving yourself. Carl Rogers was a leader in his field. He was born in 1902. His focus on the individual human experience and self-actualization changed the way people thought about these things and went against the popular psychoanalysis and behaviorist views of the time. Rogers' method was person-centered, emphasizing each person's inherent goodness and growth potential. His work has a long impact on psychology, counseling, and psychotherapy because it is full of kindness and understanding. Rogers thought that people needed to feel unconditional positive regard in order to reach a state of self-actualization, which is the best level of psychological growth and the point at which a person realizes their full potential. Rogers came up with this phrase to describe fully accepting and loving oneself, no matter what or who you are. That's what self-love looks like. The most important thing in Rogers' humanistic psychology is pure love. Roger stressed that self-love shouldn't depend on results, support from others, or following social rules. It shouldn't depend on what you've done. Therefore, he pushed for self-love that isn't affected by these outside factors and is based on knowing and accepting one's own unique innate worth. Rogers says that loving yourself is not a sign of ego or pride. It's not about thinking you're better than other people. Instead, it's about recognizing your worth, being open to your own experiences, and believing what you think and feel. Rogers thought that this kind of self-love is essential for personal growth and reaching one's full potential. When we love ourselves no matter what, we make it safe to explore and learn about ourselves. We let mistakes happen and learn from them, which promotes growth personally. We also develop an internal locus of evaluation, which means we trust our own decisions and don't just look to other people's ideas to back them up. According to Roger, embracing our capacity for change and growth is another aspect of self-love. It has to do with realizing that we are not fixed things, 
but are always changing. In this sense, self-love entails embracing both the person we are right now and the person we can grow into. Additionally, Rogers' therapy was based on the idea that a therapist's job was to create an atmosphere of sincerity, understanding, and unconditional positive respect in order to help their clients develop self-love and growth. He said that people automatically move toward better self-understanding, self-acceptance, and self-actualization when they are in such a setting. That shows Roger's faith in the healing power of loving yourself. Roger's view on self-love not only changed the way therapy is done, but it also has a lot to do with what we're talking about. His ideas give us a new way of looking at things. They encourage us to love ourselves no matter what, and they show us that doing so can lead to personal growth and self-realization. Now we'll look at the work of Abraham Maslow, who was one of the first psychologists to use humanistic methods. As with Carl Rogers, Maslow's ideas about the order of needs and self-actualization give us a convincing way to look at our conversation. The famous American psychologist Abraham Maslow was born in 1908 and made a big difference in the field with his humanistic method. This view, which is sometimes called the third force in psychology, stresses how good people are by nature and how important it is for them to grow psychologically in a healthy way. Maslow is probably best known for his theory of the hierarchy of needs, which is still used today in business, marketing, psychology, and even education. Maslow put the idea of self-actualization at the top of his hierarchy of needs because it was the most important thing to him. Maslow said that self-actualization is the process of reaching your full potential over time. This idea, which is all about personal growth and improvement, is linked to what we talked about when we talked about self-love and healthy selfishness. At the base of Maslow's ladder of needs are basic needs like food and water. At the top are self-actualization needs. Maslow says that people must first meet their basic wants in order to go after their more important ones. In other words, someone must first meet their needs for safety, love and connection and respect before they can try to become their best selves. Self-love and selfishness can be seen in a very interesting way through this idea. In the framework of Maslow's structure, Loving yourself is an important part of meeting all of these needs. The more we love ourselves, the more we take care of our wants, from the physical to the mental. Self-care, which could be seen as a good form of selfishness, is an important step on the path to becoming your best self. Maslow also talked about how important self-esteem was in the order. He did this to show how self-love and respect are for personal growth. It was his idea that people need to respect themselves and others in order to move up the system. Self-love is very important because it's what makes self-esteem and self-respect possible. In addition, the search for self-actualization can be seen as a good form of selfishness. Maslow says that seeking personal growth, satisfaction and peak moments is a part of self-actualization it's about getting better at being yourself. Some might say that this is a form of selfishness, but it is a good and healthy thing to do because it leads to personal growth and happiness. Maslow's theory acknowledges the significance of a certain amount of selfishness in living a happy life by focusing on personal growth and the satisfaction of one's own needs. It's important to remember, though, that Maslow also thought of transcendence as part of self-actualization. This meant helping others and seeing how you are connected to the rest of humanity. Abraham Maslow's ideas give us a new and interesting way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. His writing reveals the road to self-actualization, emphasizing the importance of healthy selfishness in our personal growth, as well as the role of self-love in meeting our needs. Going back in time to learn about ancient wisdom, we now look at Aristotle, 
one of the most important philosophers in history. His wide-ranging work, which includes philosophy, ethics and politics, has influenced thought for hundreds of years and can still teach us a lot about self-love and healthy selfishness. Aristotle was born in 384 BC. He studied under Plato and then taught Alexander the Great. He opened a school in Athens called the Lyceum and taught there for more than 10 years. His work had a huge impact on philosophy in the West and laid the groundwork for many later philosophical ideas and ways of doing things. The idea of eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness or flourishing, is at the heart of Aristotle's ethical philosophy. Aristotle said that eudaimonia is the most important thing in life and in thought. It is, however, a permanent state of being that comes from living a life of virtue and realizing one's full potential rather than a fleeting state of happiness or pleasure. The ideas of self-love and reasonable self-interest are deeply linked to the idea of eudaimonia. Aristotle said that loving oneself is not only okay, it's important for eudaimonia. He thought that self-love wasn't about being selfish, but about wanting and working toward what is good for yourself. Aristotle's idea of reasonable self-interest is related to his idea of self-love. He said that we are logical humans who want to reach our fullest potential by nature. So, to truly love ourselves, we need to seek virtue and wisdom and basically become the best versions of ourselves. It's a type of good selfishness where one looks for personal growth and satisfaction without hurting other people, but rather as a way to make a difference in society. Let's look at some real-world examples to help you understand how Aristotle's ideas can be used. Like, let's say you're an artist. In the Aristotelian sense, loving yourself would mean putting all of your efforts into getting better at what you do, finding and using your own unique artistic style, and reaching your fullest potential. You can make a difference in the world in your own unique way by recognizing your interest and ability. Or think about a situation where you have to choose between a high-paying job that doesn't bring you joy and a lower-paying job that does. According to Aristotle's philosophy, loving oneself entails taking the road that makes you truly happy and helps you reach your full potential, even if it seems harder or less rewarding at the time. To sum up Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia, these examples show what it means to live a happy life by seeking virtue and personal excellence. Self-love and a certain amount of selfishness are not only good, they are necessary in this situation. In turn, they push us to improve ourselves and reach our full potential, which leads to our personal growth and, in turn, the improvement of our communities. Aristotle's wisdom opens up a new way to think about self-love and healthy selfishness. It supports the idea that these ideas are not at odds with each other, but work together to make a happy life. His philosophy encourages us to consider our abilities, our interests, and the decisions we make, emphasizing the significance of loving ourselves well and acting in our own best interests. The next stop on our trip is Ayn Rand, a controversial but important figure in both writing and philosophy. Born in Russia in 1905, Rand moved to the United States in the 1920s. It was there that she came up with the thought system called objectivism, which can be found in her books like The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Rand's philosophy supports a level of ethical egoism that she called the virtue of selfishness. This gives us a unique way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. Objectivism, Ayn Rand's philosophy, says that the most important thing in life is to be happy. She pushed for a kind of logical selfishness in which each person's own life and happiness are their most important goals. Objectivism says that everyone has a moral duty to look out for themselves, not help others, and protect their own rights. In her book The Virtue of Selfishness, Rand says that her idea of selfishness 
is not not caring about other people, but not being willing to give up something for them. It's important to note that Rand's idea of reasonable selfishness doesn't support hurting or taking advantage of other people. It's about being true to yourself, sticking to your goals and beliefs, and living in a way that makes you happy in the end. Rand argued that one must use reason to decide one's own interests, avoiding the trap of instant satisfaction or short-term benefits at the price of long-term well-being. Let's break down Rand's idea of reasonable selfishness to get a better sense of her point of view. The word rational is very important here. Rand's selfishness isn't about giving in to whims or short-term wants. It's about acting in a way that benefits herself in the long run. Rand says that someone who is truly selfish would never hurt others, lie, or steal, because it would not make sense for them to do those things. It breaks down trust, hurts relationships, and makes life difficult in the long run. A strong sense of self-respect and self-esteem are also central to Rand's definition of selfishness. Aristotle talked about self-love in a similar way that Rand does. Rand's selfishness is about loving oneself, staying true to one's ideals, and seeking personal growth and satisfaction. Indeed, Rand says that this kind of logical selfishness is necessary for a society to be fair. Everyone should look out for their own best interests and accept the rights of others to do the same. This will create a society where people work together and value each other. Rand said that a world where everyone exhibits logical selfishness is one where people are free, happy, and respectful of each other's rights. As we talk about self-love and healthy selfishness, Ayn Rand gives us a thought-provoking point of view. Her support for sensible selfishness goes against common sense and makes us think again about what selfishness means to us and how it affects our lives. It's a stark reminder of how important it is to live our lives in line with our ideals and our own best interests, and to understand the fundamental role this plays in our general health and happiness. There's no denying the importance of recognizing and embracing our own self-interest, even if some people think her philosophy is too extreme or just a cold-hearted support of egocentrism. We not only find personal happiness by doing this, but we also help make society more honest, open, and, in the end, peaceful. Our intellectual journey now takes us to the peaceful world of Stoicism, where we meet Epictetus, a famous thinker from this school of thought. Even though he had a hard childhood and was born a slave in Phrygia around 55 AD, Epictetus went on to become one of the most important Stoic philosophers. His lessons have been useful for hundreds of years and are still useful today. The philosophy of Stoicism says that virtue, wisdom, and morals are the best ways to be happy. We may not be able to change what happens to us, but we can change how we react to it. The Stoic philosophy says that we should be calm and accept our fate and circumstances while focused on getting better through reason, self-discipline, and virtue. Epictetus is a well-known Stoic philosopher who is best known for his ideas about inner freedom and self-control. Some of his most important books, like Discourses and Enchiridion, go into great detail about these ideas. Epictetus says we need to know the difference between what we can control, like our thoughts, feelings and actions, and what we can't, like outside events, other people's actions or their views. This knowledge is what his philosophy and Stoic thought in general are built on. Self-control in the Epicurean sense is more than just staying away from temptations and acting on impulse. Instead, it's about being able to control how we feel and respond to things happening around us. It means realizing that our inner state or happiness is not determined by what happens to us, but by how we answer it. This point of view is very much in line with self-love because it tells us to take care of our mental and emotional health, 
and keep our inner peace. Stoicism places a high value on taking care of oneself, emphasizing the importance of maintaining tranquility, emotional resilience, and moral honesty. In Stoicism, self-care isn't just about treating yourself or relaxing physically, despite what most people think. It means keeping your mind, body, and soul in balance by doing things like meditating, reflecting, and taking care of your health. It also means developing our reason, controlling our feelings, and increasing our virtue, all of which are connected to loving yourself and acting in your own best interests. The ideas of self-love and reasonable self-interest are profoundly echoed in the lessons of Epictetus and Stoic philosophy. He tells us to put our inner peace first, think clearly, and support moral virtues, all of which are manifestations of self-love and self-interest. The idea of keeping inner freedom and self-control, however, may be where the most important agreement lies. Being self-aware, respecting ourselves, and taking responsibility for our mental health are all important parts of loving yourself and acting in your own best interests. Putting Epictetus's ideas into practice in our daily lives can have big impacts. Let's say that a project at work is making you feel worried. Use Epictetus's advice to figure out what you can control instead of letting your worry take over. You can't change how the job turns out, but you can change how hard you work on it, how you use your time, and how you deal with stress. Or, if you're having a hard time with your self-esteem, it can help to think about what Epictetus said about inner freedom. Figure out that your morals, deeds, and inner peace are what make you valuable, not what other people think or what happens. Our next guide is Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher and one of the most important figures in existential philosophy. He will help us find our way through the complicated maze of self-love and selfishness. Sartre was born in Paris in 1905 and wrote and thought a lot. His ideas have had a big impact on Western philosophy, especially existentialism and phenomenology. Existentialism, the philosophical movement that Sartre helped spread, is based on the idea that each person has a unique experience in a world that is either not caring about them or even unfriendly to them. People in this school of thought value freedom, choice, and responsibility. Existentialists say that each person is free to decide what their life is all about. This freedom is both freeing and challenging because it comes with the duty of choice. The popular idea in Sartre's philosophy is that existence precedes essence, which means that as people, we exist first, and then it is up to each of us to shape our essence or nature. Sartre's idea of sincerity is based on this freedom from the inside out. Living in a way that is true to you, regardless of what other people think or expect of you. Accepting this psychological freedom and taking full responsibility for our actions, decisions and the results that follow is what Sartre meant by authenticity. You have to realize that you are in charge of your own life and can't put the blame on other people or outside events. In Sartre's own words, man is condemned to be free because he is responsible for everything he does once he is out in the world. Authenticity, self-love and selfishness all have interesting things in common. Sartre's idea of authenticity is linked to self-love and healthy selfishness because it tells us to be true to ourselves and put our beliefs and values first. Recognizing our wants, taking responsibility for our decisions, and living in line with who we really are, are all necessary steps. This is about liking yourself enough to live in a way that is true to who you are, even if that means going against what other people think is right. Genuineness, on the other hand, isn't about navel-gazing selfishness for Sartre, it's about freedom and duty. It's not a reason to ignore other people or avoid doing what you need to do. Instead, it's a call to be real with our freedom, 
and the choices it gives us. There is a small but important difference between this and selfishness. Being real means being aware of and acting on our wants, but it doesn't mean stepping on other people to get what we want. Think about your connections with other people to see how Sartre's idea of truthfulness can be used in real life. Being real means telling the truth about your needs and feelings, even if they're different from what your partner, friend or family wants. It's about being brave enough to be yourself and not giving up your ideals or morals to make other people happy. In a work setting, living authentically might mean picking a job path that makes you happy instead of one that is popular or pays well. Recognizing your interests and goals and taking ownership of the decisions that support them are the key. Sartre's idea of sincerity is an interesting way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. His philosophical philosophy tells us to enjoy our freedom, take responsibility for our lives, and be brave enough to live honestly. This helps us learn more about self-love and selfishness. Let's keep going on our philosophical trip. This time we'll go east and find safety under the Bodhi tree of Buddhism. From what Siddhartha Gautama, also known as the Buddha, taught in the 6th century BC, this very old philosophy grew. Millions of people around the world have benefited from the Buddha's lessons enduring wisdom and direction. The Four Noble Truths are at the heart of Buddha's lessons. They explain what pain is, why it happens, how to stop it, and the way to do it. The Noble Eightfold Path is what the Buddha said you should do to end your pain and reach Nirvana, which is a state of perfect peace and understanding. The Middle Way, which is also called the Noble Eightfold Path, is an important part of what Buddha taught. The middle way is a road of balance, somewhere between giving in to your wants and not giving in to your needs. It stays away from both sides and instead encourages a calm and thoughtful way of living. The Buddha found this way after trying both extreme poverty and lavish wealth and learning that neither was the way to true happiness or enlightenment. This is a complete road that includes mental control, wisdom, and moral behavior. It includes having the right view, the right intention, the right speech, the right action, the right livelihood, the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right concentration. These things, taken together, make up a healthy way of life that helps people be free from pain. When we study the middle way's effects on self-love and selfishness, an interesting interplay becomes clear. Self-love from a Buddhist viewpoint can be seen as a caring care for one's well-being, both physical and mental. It includes encouraging wholesome states of thinking and minimizing unwholesome ones. The practice of self-love fits well with the middle way, as it includes taking care of oneself without falling into the extremes of narcissism or self-neglect. On the other hand, Selfishness in Buddhism isn't inherently demonized. Instead, it's the unskillful or harmful expressions of selfishness that are discouraged, such as greed, hatred, and delusion. These are seen as roots of suffering that pull one away from the right path. However, a healthy sense of selfishness, like caring for one's well-being, is important in Buddhism, as it helps cultivate self-love and compassion which are crucial in walking the middle way. Let's consider the practice of meditation, a fundamental part of Buddhist practice. Meditation can be seen as an act of self-love and healthy selfishness. It's a time you dedicate entirely to yourself, focusing inward and cultivating a tranquil and mindful state of mind. This practice aligns perfectly with the middle way, nurturing balance and avoiding extremes like excessive outward focus or complete detachment. In a real-world context, the middle way can guide us to balance our personal and professional lives, taking care of our needs without neglecting our responsibilities towards others. It can inspire us to live healthily, neither indulging excessively in sensual pleasures nor denying ourselves joy and comfort. 
It teaches us to approach life with equanimity, understanding, and compassion, not just for others, but also for ourselves. The Buddha's middle way provides a compelling perspective on the delicate balance between self-love and selfishness. It encourages us to cultivate self-love and a healthy sense of self-interest without swinging to the extremes of self-indulgence or self-denial. As we delve deeper into our exploration, we turn our gaze to the mid-20th century and the contributions of a German social psychologist, psychoanalyst, sociologist, and humanistic philosopher, Erich Fromm. Born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1900, Fromm's ideas transcended academic fields, providing profound insights into human behavior, love, and society. Fromm is best known for his work, The Art of Loving, published in 1956. In this seminal work, he presents love not as a sentiment easily swayed by passion or external factors, but as an art that one must cultivate and nurture. According to Fromm, the practice of love involves a sense of discipline, concentration, patience, and a transcendence of narcissism. Most importantly, it requires an ability to love oneself. Fromm's conception of self-love is far from the notion of narcissism or conceitedness. He emphasized that loving oneself and loving others are two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. To Fromm, self-love means acknowledging one's own worth and not hating oneself for one's shortcomings. It's a deep appreciation for oneself that, in turn, allows for the genuine love of others. Fromm wrote, In the experience of love lies the only answer to being human, lies sanity. He believed that an individual's mental health could not be separated from their capacity to love themselves and others. He argued that self-love and the love for others are intertwined, noting that love isn't possible without self-love, and self-love isn't possible without the love for others. In practical terms, Fromm's idea of self-love encourages us to maintain a balance between caring for ourselves and for others. It's about acknowledging our own needs and aspirations while respecting and caring for the needs and aspirations of others. It rejects the notion of self-love as a narcissistic, self-absorbed act, redefining it instead as an inclusive act that extends beyond the self. In our relationships, whether personal or professional, Fromm's idea encourages us to practice active listening, understanding, and mutual respect, stemming from the love we cultivate for ourselves and extend to others. It pushes us to be patient, not just with others, but also with ourselves, as we navigate through the challenges of life. In the realm of personal growth and development, Fromm's concept teaches us to embrace our flaws and work on them without hating or being too harsh on ourselves. It encourages a healthy level of self-critique and introspection, fostering personal growth and a better understanding of ourselves. Fromm's perspective on self-love as an integral part of loving others provides a crucial layer to our understanding of self-love and selfishness. His thoughts encourage us to recognize self-love not as an isolated, self-centered act, but as a vital step towards loving others and leading a wholesome life. As we journey through the different philosophies and psychological perspectives on self-love and selfishness, we find ourselves in a mosaic of ideas, each unique yet sharing common threads. Comparing and contrasting these perspectives helps us appreciate their depth and diversity and guides us in integrating these principles into our daily lives. Starting with Carl Rogers, we saw that self-love is intrinsically tied to the concept of self-actualization. A positive view of oneself enables one to explore their potentials and capabilities fully. The concept of self-actualization resurfaces in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, emphasizing self-love as a crucial element in fulfilling our highest potential. Aristotle's eudaimonia echoes similar sentiments, 
with the pursuit of happiness through self-realization and the achievement of personal excellence. On the other hand, Ayn Rand's objectivism introduces the idea of rational selfishness, arguing that pursuing one's self-interest when done rationally is the highest moral purpose. This contrasts with the Stoic perspective represented by Epictetus, which advocates for self-control and inner freedom, seeking tranquility and virtue rather than immediate self-gratification. Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialist perspective throws us into the pursuit of authenticity, implying that self-love is about embracing our freedom and taking responsibility for our actions. Meanwhile, Buddha's middle way teaches us to navigate between the extremes of self-denial and self-indulgence, emphasizing the need for a balanced approach to self-love and selfishness. Eric Fromm bridges these different perspectives by presenting self-love as an art crucial for our ability to love others. His work underscores the mutual interdependence between loving oneself and loving others. Despite their varied historical and cultural contexts, these philosophers and psychologists share an appreciation for the value of self-love and a balanced sense of selfishness. They all recognize in one way or another that self-love is not an act of vanity or narcissism, but a crucial part of human well-being and a key to a fulfilling life. The concept of selfishness, too, is reframed as a healthy act of caring for oneself and not an expression of disregard for others. In terms of applying these perspectives to contemporary life, we can take away several valuable lessons. Self-love is about recognizing our self-worth and treating ourselves with kindness and respect. It involves understanding and meeting our needs, whether physical, emotional or psychological. Healthy selfishness, on the other hand, is about setting boundaries and making time for ourselves amid our busy lives. It's about asserting our interests while maintaining empathy and consideration for others. In a world that often demands us to put others' needs before our own, these philosophical and psychological perspectives remind us of the importance of taking care of ourselves too. After all, as the adage goes, you cannot pour from an empty cup. In the act of nurturing ourselves, we become better equipped to contribute to the world and enrich the lives of those around us. As we venture forth into our individual journeys, let these philosophers and psychologists be our guides. Let their insights illuminate our paths as we navigate the terrains of self-love and selfishness as we endeavor to create a balance that fosters personal development and contributes to a good life, as you venture forth, hold on to the insight that self-love and balanced selfishness are not barriers to our growth, but catalysts for it. They form the undercurrent of a life that's not just good, but meaningful, fulfilling, and truly our own. Have you ever found yourself pondering over the fundamental questions of human existence, who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? If you have, you've unknowingly delved into the realm of existentialism, a philosophy that places human individual existence, freedom, and choice at its center. Imagine you're floating in the endless cosmos, gazing down at the world, a tiny sphere amidst an infinite expanse. All the successes, all the failures, the entire human experience condensed into this one small dot. It's overwhelming, right? It might even seem absurd. But don't despair, because that sense of insignificance is precisely where existentialism begins. Existentialism, in its simplest terms, is a philosophy concerned with finding the self and the meaning of life through free will, choice, and personal responsibility. It rejects the idea that the universe inherently holds any truths or meaning about our individual lives. Rather, it suggests that it's up to each of us to give our own life meaning, to navigate this vast, uncaring universe where established structures or morals offer no easy paths. This philosophy originated in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 
born out of the chaos and disillusionment following World War II. It was a philosophical rebellion, one that sought to explore the human condition in a world that appeared increasingly absurd. Among the many philosophers who contributed to this thought-provoking field, two names are particularly prominent and will serve as our guiding stars throughout this exploration, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Jean-Paul Sartre, the renowned French philosopher, is often seen as the pivotal figure in existentialist thought. His belief that existence precedes essence encapsulates the idea that we come into the world without predefined purpose or nature and that we must create our essence through our choices and actions. In Sartre's view, we are not born with a specific mission or inherent meaning. Rather, we find ourselves in a seemingly arbitrary world and it becomes our existential responsibility to shape our destiny and give our life its unique meaning. Then we have Albert Camus, another French philosopher who, while often associated with existentialism, preferred to identify his philosophy as absurdist. For Camus, the universe is indifferent to our struggles, our joys, our existence. But rather than spiraling into despair, he saw this recognition as a starting point to create our own meaning, to rebel against the absurdity and embrace the freedom it offers. We'll be diving deep into their philosophies, unpacking their key concepts, and exploring how their ideas can provide valuable insight into our own lives. Because isn't that the ultimate goal? To understand and navigate our existence in this grand cosmos. Welcome to our journey into the heart of existentialism, a journey where we may not find easy answers, but will undoubtedly uncover thought-provoking questions about life, freedom, and personal responsibility. The roots of existentialism, while firmly planted in the 19th and 20th centuries, stretch back much further, drawing nourishment from the rich philosophical soil of the past. The philosophy's emphasis on individual experience, freedom, and the meaning of existence can be traced to the works of thinkers like Søren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche. Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher in the mid-19th century, is often hailed as the first existentialist thinker. He emphasized the importance of individual experience and personal responsibility, arguing against the trend of philosophical abstraction and insisting on the centrality of the individual's direct lived experience. He argued that truth is subjectivity, meaning that the most significant truths, especially those concerning ethics and religion, are deeply personal and subjective. On the other hand, we have Nietzsche, an iconoclastic German philosopher who fiercely criticized the established values of his time. Nietzsche's philosophy echoed the existentialist theme of individualism. He emphasized the creative, life-affirming individual who defies conventional morality to create their own values. Despite these early roots, existentialism as we understand it today came into its own in the aftermath of the Second World War, a time that witnessed cataclysmic despair, loss, and a crisis of identity. It was a period where previously held societal and philosophical certainties were upended, forcing humanity to reassess its place in the world. In this context, existentialism's emphasis on personal freedom, the responsibility of choice, and the search for authentic existence resonated deeply. The core tenet of this philosophy, that existence precedes essence, countered the traditional philosophical view that essence or asset nature precedes existence. This revolutionary idea suggested that we are born without a predetermined purpose or nature, and that it's our responsibility to define ourselves through our actions and choices. Simon de Beauvoir, another significant existentialist thinker, echoed this sentiment in her seminal work, The Second Sex, where she examined the existentialist dilemma through the lens of women's experience, thus connecting existentialism with the growing feminist movement. 
The existentialist philosophy was also profoundly influenced by the rapidly changing political landscape. The rise of totalitarian regimes, the horrors of the Holocaust, and the nuclear threat led to a profound sense of fear, uncertainty, and alienation, which was echoed in existentialist works. Finally, it's essential to highlight the cultural landscape, notably the fields of literature and art, which significantly influenced existentialism. Existential themes are apparent in the works of Fyodor Dostoevsky, Franz Kafka, and Samuel Beckett, whose characters often grapple with despair, isolation, and the absurdity of existence, vividly illustrating existentialist ideas. Thus, existentialism came from the convergence of philosophical thought, historical change, and cultural expression. A response to the modern world's challenges, pushing individuals to face their existence's absurdity and find personal meaning amidst the chaos. Having set the historical stage, let's now move on to the key figures of our exploration, Sartre and Camus. Their beliefs, born out of this tumultuous time, continue to challenge and inspire us as we manage the complexities of our own lives. Jean-Paul Sartre, born in 1905 in Paris, France, was a man of many skills. He was a philosopher, novelist, playwright, and critic, with an impact that stretched far beyond the boundaries of academic philosophy. He is commonly known as the leading figure of the existentialist movement. Orphaned at a young age, Sartre was raised by his grandparents. He excelled intellectually and attended a top university in Paris. There, he met his lifelong partner, Simone de Beauvoir, a formidable thinker in her own right, and formed a radical, open relationship that would question social rules. Sartre served as a meteorologist in the French army during World War II and was taken by German troops in 1940. His experiences of war and imprisonment deeply shaped his philosophical view, fueling his deep engagement with questions of freedom, responsibility, and the meaning of life. One of Sartre's most important contributions to existentialist philosophy is his statement that existence preceded essence. This idea counters traditional philosophy, which usually posits that things have a defined core or nature that determines their purpose. In comparison, Sartre believes that human beings first appear, meet themselves, and only then define their essence or nature. This idea is closely tied to Sartre's thought of radical freedom. For Sartre, each person is radically free and responsible for their acts. Since there is no set human character or external source of value, every action a person takes helps define what it means to be human. This freedom makes me feel both free and scared. It gives people endless ways to kill themselves, but it also makes them take full responsibility for their life and decisions. Sartre says that people often try to avoid the stress of being free by acting like they are not free. He called this bad faith. When we blame our situations, our genes, or social standards, we avoid taking responsibility for our actions and freedom. Recognizing our rights is the first thing that needs to be done to live a true life. Sartre's philosophy also thinks a lot about the idea of nothingness. He wrestles with the idea of awareness as a form of nothingness that separates us from the world and gives us the freedom to rise above our circumstances in being and nothingness, one of his most important works. These ideas see the human situation as a paradoxical conflict between being and nothingness, a battle that makes us who we are. In addition, Sartre talks about the idea of the other person's look or gaze. Noticing how other people see us can make us feel like objects, which is what he meant by his famous phrase, hell is other people. For Sartre, this doesn't mean that all relationships are bad, but it does mean that knowing other people's points of view can limit our freedom. 
Sartre's philosophy is deeply connected to his work for social justice and political action. He didn't just see philosophy as a subject to be studied, he saw it as a way to question, seek, and change society. Existentialism was an action philosophy that told people to be aware of their freedom and use it to fight unfairness and make their lives more real. Being and Nothingness, which came out in 1943, is probably Sartre's most important work. This book delves deeply into phenomenology and existentialism, looking at things like human awareness, freedom, and the nature of life in great depth. In Being and Nothingness, Sartre talks about two different kinds of being. The first is the being in itself, which is like the objective existence of inanimate things that don't have awareness. And the second is the being for itself, which is like the subjective existence of conscious beings, our state of being. Inside the being for itself, Sartre finds the most important thing about being human, freedom. Sartre says that people are naturally free because they are not set things, but rather becomings. Our awareness, our nothingness, separates us from the world and lets us question, negate, and imagine realities that are not the way things are. Being able to go beyond is and imagine what could be is at the heart of Sartre's philosophy. To show this, think about this quote from Being and Nothingness. Man is not the sum of what he has, but the totality of what he does not yet have, of what he could have. This powerful phrase shows that Sartre saw man as an unfinished project, whose existence was not determined by his past or present state, but by his future possibilities, his ability to change, create, and redefine himself. Moving on to Nausea, Sartre's first book, and another important part of his philosophical thought. It came out in 1938, and is about Antoine Rocantin, a man who is going through a deep psychological crisis and feels sick as he thinks about how pointless and ridiculous life is. Sartre looks at themes like loneliness, freedom, and the lack of external meaning through Rocantin's psychological pain. When Rocantin realizes that the world doesn't care about him and that his life has no purpose, he feels like throwing up, which is how Sartre explains the feeling. This word summarizes the deep discomfort that can come from realizing how silly life is at its core. Take a look at this quote from Nausea. Every existing thing is born without reason, prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. This disturbing realization sums up Rocentin's angst, and by extension, our own psychological situation in a world that doesn't have any meaning on its own. How do we handle things? What do we do? As Sartre saw it, the answer lies in the freedom that this folly gives us. The lack of fundamental meaning doesn't mean you have to be sad. Instead, it opens up a world of options. It gives us the power, or even forces us, to make our own purpose and define who we are through the decisions and actions we make. Another quote from Nausea echoes this idea. I am free. There is absolutely no more reason for living. All the ones I've tried have given way, and I can't imagine more of them. I have to build them myself. This is a clear call to action, a recognition of how hard it is, but also freeing it is to make our own meaning in a world that won't give it to us. Sartre's writings, like Being and Nothingness and Nausea, are brave and complex looks at what it means to be human. They push us to face the unsettling truth that we are free and that there is no external meaning, but they also give us the power to accept that we are the ones who make our identity. Albert Camus was born in 193 in French Algeria and grew up in terrible poverty. This made him more politically aware and more sympathetic to those who were on the outside. Because he was such a good student, the University of Algiers gave him a grant to study philosophy. There, he discovered his love for theatre, journalism, and political activity. 
Although Camus moved to France right before World War II, he quickly became involved in the French resistance. As editor of the secret newspaper Combat, he spoke out against fascism. Combining philosophy, writing, and political action was what made Camus's work unique and shaped his unique philosophical view. Existentialism is often linked to Camus, but he famously refused to use that term. Instead, he called his philosophy a philosophy of the absurd. Camus said that the insanity of life comes from the clash between our need for meaning, order, and clarity, and the absence of these things in the world. In his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus goes into great detail about his concept of the absurd, which is at the core of his philosophy. Sisyphus was cursed to forever roll a boulder up a hill, only to have it roll back down again. Like Sisyphus, we have to face the absurdity of our lives, the circle of death and life that seems pointless in a world that doesn't care. But Camus doesn't think this foolishness makes us sad. Instead, he thought that recognizing the ridiculous gave us the freedom to live fully and honestly. In his own words, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. Camus also suggested that people should rebel against nonsense. We act as a form of personal revolt by choosing to keep living even though life is crazy. This affirms our presence and honor. This idea of revolt is also present in his political views, where he fought for fairness and freedom from oppression. The focus on human meaning and morality is another important part of Camus's philosophy. Camus thought that we could and should make our own morals, even though there were no external meanings or moral rules that applied to everyone. Most of the time, these values were easy pleasures and physical experiences for Camus, like feeling the sun on his face, enjoying the beauty of the Mediterranean, and being with friends. This focus on the sensual and real is summed up by Meursault, the main character in his book, The Stranger, who lives only in the physical world. Camus didn't ignore the significance of moral purity, even while embracing the physical. Camus believed that each person was responsible for their own actions in a world without morals or meaning. But this moral duty wasn't based on God's command or social rules. It came from a personal promise to live honestly and fight against unfairness. Camus' work on the philosophy of the absurd is both enlightening and inspiring. His philosophy pushes us to face how silly our lives are and encourages us to make the most of them by rebelling against the system and finding our own meaning. Camus' first book, The Stranger, came out in 1942 and is probably his most well-known work. The main character, Meursault, tells the story, and the book explores themes of nonsense, indifference and rebellion, which are important parts of Camus's philosophy. In the book, Meursault, a French Algerian, doesn't care about anything and reacts to the world around him in a way that is almost apathetic. He doesn't show any emotion when his mother dies, and he doesn't feel bad when he does something violent for no reason. His emotional separation from the world shows that he doesn't care about social rules and standards, which is what Camus meant by the word absurd. The courtroom scene is important for understanding Meursault's thoughts because it's where he says, I had lived my life one way, and I could just as well have lived it another. I had done this, and I hadn't done that. I hadn't done this thing, but I had done another. This quote says everything about Meursault's character and Camus' philosophy of absurdism. For him, life is a series of random choices with no real meaning. This point of view might seem pessimistic, but Camus believed that realizing how silly life is doesn't make you give up or do nothing. Instead, it gives people the chance to live a free life, free from the restrictions of social rules and standards. By putting Meursault to death, Camus makes this point very clear. In the face of death, he chooses to embrace life's absurdity, 
and feels a sense of kinship with the indifferent universe, echoing Camus' call to revolt against the absurd and affirm life. But The Stranger is more than just a story about psychological angst and rebellion. It also looks at morals in a complex way. The things Merceau does and the reactions people have to them make us think about what morality is, especially in a world with no built-in moral code. Is there a sense of right and wrong in a world that doesn't make sense? If so, what does it mean? Camus doesn't give us easy answers. Instead, he forces us to think about these issues on our own, telling us that we are responsible for making our own moral guide. In the last lines of the book, Meursault thinks, For everything to be consummated, for me to feel less alone, I had only to wish that there be a large crowd of spectators the day of my execution and that they greet me with cries of hate. The main character in The Stranger vividly shows Camus's philosophy of the absurd. We face the universe's indifference and the randomness of life, and we are asked to think about meaning and morals in a world that doesn't have a purpose of its own. Sobering and empowering. His philosophy challenges us to confront the absurdity of our existence while inspiring us to affirm our lives through personal revolt and the creation of individual meaning. In our next segment, we'll explore how these existential philosophies of Sartre and Camus can apply to our daily lives, guiding us in our quest for authenticity, freedom and personal meaning. Having journeyed through the minds of Sartre and Camus, we now turn to the fundamental question, how does existential philosophy relate to our modern life? How can these insights from the mid-20th century help us navigate our lives in the 21st century? To begin with, both philosophers offer a paradigm shift in how we approach life. From Sartre, we are urged to embrace our radical freedom and the responsibility it entails. In a world often driven by external influences, societal norms, family expectations, and cultural trends, we are reminded that we possess the freedom to define ourselves, to choose who we are and what we value. This can be seen in the choices we make daily, whether it's our career path, our relationships, our hobbies, or our response to the challenges life presents us. We are not bound by our circumstances, our past, or other people's expectations. We are free to shape our existence and to bear the responsibility for our actions. This perspective can lead to an empowering sense of agency and authenticity. Consider a practical example. You may find yourself working a job that doesn't fulfill you, perhaps chosen due to societal pressure or familial expectations. Sartre's philosophy would encourage you to embrace your freedom, to evaluate your options, and to make a conscious choice about your career path based on your authentic desires and values, rather than external pressures. From Camus, we learn to acknowledge and confront the absurdity of life, rather than seeking solace in illusions of objective meaning or ultimate salvation. We are encouraged to create our personal meaning and values. This can liberate us from the societal rat race and the unending pursuit of externally defined success. Furthermore, Camus' notion of revolt can inspire us to affirm our lives even amidst adversity and suffering. Consider a situation where you're confronted with a personal setback, like a failure or loss. Camus' philosophy would urge you to confront this adversity head-on, to recognize its absurdity and to continue striving regardless, thus revolting against the absurd. Applying this to a practical context, suppose you experience a failure in your personal or professional life. Rather than surrendering to despair or viewing it as a commentary on your self-worth, you could see it as an integral part of life's absurdity and use the experience to grow and reaffirm your commitment to your chosen path. Additionally, the existentialist focus on authenticity encourages us to engage deeply with our passions and interests, 
enhancing our sense of purpose and fulfillment in a world often preoccupied with superficial pleasures and distractions. Existentialism calls us back to a genuine engagement with life. Existentialism challenges us to take moral responsibility for our actions. In a world devoid of absolute moral laws, we are urged to create our moral compass. This requires introspection, dialogue, and conscious decision-making, promoting a more mindful and engaged approach to ethics. Existentialism invites us to reconsider how we perceive our lives and our search for purpose by highlighting the lack of inherent meaning and the responsibility each of us has to create our path. Existentialism offers a roadmap for those seeking purpose and fulfillment in today's fast-paced, complex world. Let's consider purpose first. In a world where myriad options can often lead to paralysis by analysis, existentialism urges us to lean into this uncertainty, this freedom, and this responsibility to make choices. Sartre's famous quote, We are our choices, underpins this existential approach to purpose. Rather than seeking an externally defined purpose, existentialism encourages us to forge our purpose through our actions, through the choices we make, and the responsibilities we take on. Imagine you're at a crossroads in your career. You have multiple paths you could take, each with its own set of potential rewards and challenges. Rather than looking outside for answers, existentialism would prompt you to introspect, to understand your true desires and values, and to choose a path aligned with those. Your purpose, then, is not something you find, but something you create through your decisions and actions. When it comes to fulfillment, existentialism offers a similarly empowering perspective. The existentialist emphasis on authenticity and engagement with life can lead to a deeper sense of fulfillment. Fulfillment, in this context, is not derived from meeting societal expectations or achieving conventional markers of success. Instead, it arises from living authentically, from choosing your path, from engaging deeply with your passions and interests, and from creating your personal meaning. For instance, you might find fulfillment in pursuing a hobby that brings you joy, even if it doesn't align with traditional notions of success or productivity. Or you might derive fulfillment from contributing to a cause you deeply care about, from building meaningful relationships, or from engaging in continuous learning and personal growth. Both Sartre and Camus assert that we create our life's meaning through our actions and attitudes. This perspective shifts the focus from external validation to internal authenticity. It reminds us that we are not passive spectators, but active participants in our lives. This shift can lead to profound personal growth and a more fulfilling life as we cease to be defined by external circumstances and begin to shape our existence based on our authentic selves. To bring this to life, imagine if you measured success not by how much money you make or how many followers you have on social media, but by how authentically you live, how passionate you are about your work, how deeply you engage with your interests, and how much you grow as an individual. This would lead to a much deeper sense of fulfillment grounded in authenticity rather than external validation. Moreover, by confronting and embracing life's inherent absurdity, as proposed by Camus, we can also find fulfillment. We cease to view life's challenges, setbacks and sufferings as interruptions to an otherwise smooth journey. Instead, we see them as integral parts of our existence, opportunities for growth and reaffirmation of our chosen path. In this context, a setback or failure is no longer a barrier to fulfillment, but a part of the journey itself. It's a chance to reevaluate, to learn, to grow, and to continue on our path with renewed determination and understanding. Existentialism provides us with a powerful lens through which to view our quest for purpose and fulfillment. 
It doesn't provide us with easy answers or predetermined paths. Instead, it arms us with the tools and perspectives needed to navigate the complexity of life, to make conscious choices, and to create our purpose and fulfillment. The relevance and impact of existentialism are as profound today as they were in the mid-20th century. The existential lens can provide clarity and direction in our increasingly complex and ambiguous world. The philosophies of Sartre and Camus invite us to reflect deeply on our lives, to question our assumptions, and to take active steps in creating our purpose and fulfillment. As we close this chapter, I encourage you, the viewer, to carry these insights with you, reflect on them, question them, discuss them, look at your life through the existential lens. Remember, your existence is not defined by external circumstances or pre-existing essences. You have the freedom to shape your existence, to create your meaning, to define your purpose, and to seek your fulfillment. In a world often brimming with uncertainty and chaos, the existential perspective serves as a reminder that we hold the pen that writes our life story. So, as we step out of the world of Sartre and Camus and back into our lives, let's do so with a renewed sense of agent authenticity and resolve to live deeply, meaningfully and authentically. Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the fast-paced modern world? Have you sought a sense of tranquility amidst chaos or clarity in the face of uncertainty? What if I told you that there is a way of life, a path, that could give you the tools to handle life's challenges with balance and resilience? That path is Stoicism, an ancient philosophy that is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Stoicism's timeless wisdom is still relevant today. To live a happy life, control your emotions, and deal with differences with grace and strength, Stoicism tells us to focus on what we can control and accept what we can't. Seneca, a famous Stoic philosopher from Rome who was born in 4 BC, was one of the most famous people to follow this way of thinking. Seneca was a philosopher, politician, playwright, and at one point in his life, an advisor to the Emperor Nero. But his deep philosophical works are what we remember him most for and what have affected generations of thinkers, leaders, and regular people alike. Of all of his philosophical writings, Letters from a Stoic is one of the most powerful. It's a collection of 124 letters that Seneca wrote to his friend Lucilius, in which he shared his thoughts, wisdom, and advice on a wide range of topics. A timeless guide to the art of living well, these letters are a rich tapestry of wisdom. They remind us of the value of virtue, the power of resilience in the face of adversity, and much more. These lessons from Seneca are not just theoretical musings, they are useful tips we can use in our daily lives. They give us a map, a way to live a good life and find peace in a chaotic world. As we read Seneca's letters to get to the heart of Stoicism, it is important to know how and why these teachings still apply to us today. The world is very different from Seneca's Rome, but people's hopes, fears, problems and feelings are largely the same. At a time when our senses are constantly being bombarded with distractions, the Stoic principle of focusing on what we can control shines like a lighthouse. It helps us clear our minds, directing our energies toward our actions and responses instead of worrying about what's going on around us. This principle can not only make us more productive, but it can also bring us peace and calm in the midst of chaos. People today often think that success means having a lot of money and being popular, but Seneca's letters remind us that real wealth and happiness come from having virtue and wisdom. These teachings push us to rethink what success means and to strive for personal growth, moral living, and meaningful relationships, which will give us a deep and lasting sense of fulfillment. Also, Seneca's honest talk about life and death is refreshingly insightful in a world that avoids talking about death. 
His ideas encourage us to face and think about our own mortality, which helps us live more purposefully, enjoy each moment, and make the most of our short lives. It's also important to remember that Seneca taught us how to control our emotions, like anger, fear, anxiety, and sadness. His teachings on emotional resilience, self-discipline, and the power of rational thought can be very useful in our mental health. The lessons we're about to talk about aren't old philosophical ideas. They're useful, powerful, and deeply connected to our modern lives. They offer timeless wisdom that can help us navigate our complicated world with poise, courage, and wisdom. In one of his letters, he said, Fire is the test of gold, adversity of strong men. This beautiful comparison perfectly captures Seneca's view on hardships. Just as fire refines gold, facing and overcoming hardships, tests, and strengthens our character. This statement is not an invitation to seek out hardships just for the sake of facing them. It is a call to change how we think about the problems we face and find the strength and resilience to deal with them. How can we use this wisdom in our modern lives? Let's look at the global pandemic as an example. For many, it was a difficult time filled with threats to their physical and mental health, financial instability, and a profound sense of uncertainty. However, it also served as a test, or fire if you will, that forced people, communities, and even nations to show resilience, innovate, and evolve. On a personal level, hardships could include losing a job, breaking up with someone, or having a health scare. These are all painful experiences, but they also offer opportunities for growth. People have learned to work from home, businesses have moved to digital platforms, communities have come together to support one another, and healthcare systems have innovated quickly to combat the virus. Losing your job could help you find a more fulfilling one or even start your own business. Ending a relationship could help you learn more about yourself and make changes for the better. Having a health scare could be a wake-up call to start putting your health first and making healthier choices in your daily life. The stoic way of dealing with these kinds of problems is not to ignore or push down the pain. Instead, they say to recognize it, accept it as real, and then use it to bring about change and growth. They believe that even though we can't always control what happens to us, we can control how we react to it. This doesn't mean that going through hard times will be easy, but Seneca's lessons give us a way to look at adversity that makes it less of a barrier and more of an opportunity to grow and develop. How can we use Seneca's wisdom in our lives today? We can start by practicing mindfulness, which means being fully present in the present moment. Whether you're working, spending time with loved ones, or just enjoying a quiet moment by yourself, Try to be fully present and savor the experience without any distractions. This will help you appreciate each moment more deeply and can also improve your focus, productivity, and overall health. Second, think about your daily routines and activities. Are you wasting time on tasks that don't matter or make you happy? Can you delegate, get rid of, or streamline these activities to make more time for what matters to you. Remember that every minute you spend on something pointless is a minute you lose for something important. Third, develop a sense of thanks for the time you have. Rather than complaining about how quickly time goes by, value each day, hour, and even breath as the valuable gifts they are. Make sure you're not just living for the future. Set goals and work hard to reach them, but don't forget to enjoy the journey to those goals. After all, life is happening right now, in the present. Seneca's thought on how short life is, is a powerful wake-up call for all of us. It's a call to stop wasting time and putting off our happiness for the future and to start living fully in the present. It's a call to remember that life is short. Seneca wrote a lot about life and philosophy, but he never forgot to talk about the importance of relationships between people. 
he had a deep understanding of the need for connection, and his ideas about friendship are still very relevant today. For example, he said, one of the most beautiful qualities of true friendship is to understand and to be understood. This simple but profound statement is full of wisdom about what friendship is and how important it is. This quote basically says that empathy is the most important thing in any friendship or relationship. To understand and be understood means to have a deep sense of mutual empathy, to be willing to listen and share, to see the world through someone else's eyes and let them see it through yours. How does this ancient wisdom apply to our modern lives? The essence of a meaningful relationship lies in empathy, in understanding each other's joys, pains, ambitions and fears, and most importantly, in providing support and compassion through all of life's ups and downs. It's important to keep these deep understanding relationships alive in a time when we're more connected digitally, but might feel emotionally distant. This means making time for these bonds, even if we're busy, whether it's having heart-to-heart -heart conversations, being there for each other when we need help, or just sharing moments of joy and laughter. Seneca's wisdom also makes us think about the relationships we already have. Are they based on mutual understanding and empathy, or are they just surface level? Are we staying in relationships that drain us or are we surrounded by people who understand and lift us up? Remember that it's the quality of our friendships, not the number of them, that matters. Finally, Seneca's quote isn't just about being understood, it's also about understanding others. This means we should try to be good listeners, compassionate, and understand others without judging them. It means we should make an effort to understand their points of view feelings and experiences. It means we should develop empathy and let it guide how we interact with others. In a world where misunderstandings often lead to conflicts, this kind of understanding is very important. Seneca's wisdom serves as a reminder of the importance of understanding and being understood. It also serves as a reminder that the foundation of every great friendship lies in mutual empathy. Seneca taught many things, including how to deal with emotions, especially anger. He wisely said, There is no more stupefying thing than anger, nothing more bent on its own strength. This lesson from Seneca shows how important it is to be in charge of your emotions, especially anger, which can be very harmful. According to Seneca, Anger is a self-centered and self-sustaining emotion that causes us to make irrational choices and take actions that we later regret. It's all too easy to give in to anger, but how can we use Seneca's wisdom to stop this? How can we better control our anger as modern people who live in a world that is frequently stressful and contentious? Seneca first wants us to understand that anger hurts us more than it hurts the people we are angry at. Once we understand this, we can start to separate ourselves from this strong emotion and see it more objectively. Self-awareness is the second thing we need to work on. We should try to figure out what makes us angry and what our body and mind are telling us that we're getting angry. Being self-aware can help us take action before our anger gets out of hand. The Stoics were firm believers in the power of reason and logic, and Seneca taught us to use reason to clear our minds in moments of anger. Is how I'm reacting right for the situation? What would be a better way to respond? In addition to awareness and relaxation methods, taking a walk, doing deep breathing exercises, or even just practicing progressive muscle relaxation can help calm the mind and body and give you a much needed break from a heated situation. Finally, from a stoic point of view, we should remember ourselves that we can only control how we reply to other people's actions. If someone's actions bother us, we can choose not to get angry, but to answer with understanding or, if necessary, firm assertiveness. Applying Seneca's wisdom, we can break free from the harmful loop of anger 
and instead cultivate mental peace and emotional resilience. Managing anger is not about suppressing our feelings, it's about dealing with them in a healthier and more productive way. In essence, Seneca tells us to see anger for what it is, a self-defeating emotion. He also gives us the means to fight it. It's a lesson in taking back our power from anger and using it for good. Tranquility, a core tenet of Stoicism and central to Seneca's teachings, is the notion that virtue is nothing else than right reason. This perspective illuminates virtue as the pinnacle of human ethics and morality, and it reveals Stoicism's profound commitment to moral integrity. But what exactly does Seneca mean when he speaks of virtue and right reason, and how can we integrate these principles? Seneca, like other Stoic philosophers, saw virtue as the highest good, superior to wealth, reputation, pleasure, or even life itself. In his view, the virtuous person lives according to reason and wisdom, treating others with fairness, showing courage in the face of adversity, exercising self-control in the presence of temptation, and displaying wisdom in all aspects of life. So how does one translate the theoretical concept of right reason into daily practice? Firstly, we can cultivate virtue by embracing wisdom and reason as guiding principles in our life. This means making decisions that are not only beneficial to us, but also ethical and just. It involves constantly seeking knowledge and understanding, being open to different perspectives, and applying critical thinking to navigate life's complexities. Secondly, Seneca encourages us to reflect on our actions and attitudes. Are they in line with the virtues we aspire to cultivate? Do we exhibit integrity even when no one is watching? Do we choose the right and just path even when the wrong one might be more convenient or rewarding? Regular self-reflection can help us align our actions with our moral compass, ensuring that we are living in accordance with virtue. Furthermore, cultivating virtue involves practicing empathy and compassion. It requires us to recognize the inherent worth of every individual and to treat others with kindness and respect. It means standing up against injustice, lending a helping hand to those in need, and striving to contribute positively to our communities. Lastly, to live according to right reason, we need to nurture a sense of resilience and equanimity. Life will inevitably throw challenges our way, but a virtuous person faces these challenges with strength and calm, not allowing external circumstances to compromise their moral values. By integrating these principles into our daily lives, we can bring Seneca's teachings to life. We can live in accordance with virtue and right reason for a sense of fulfillment and peace that extends beyond transient pleasures or external achievements. Seneca's emphasis on virtue serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of moral integrity in a world often driven by materialistic pursuits. His teachings inspire us to prioritize virtue, to strive for moral excellence, and to live in harmony with our highest values as we navigate the complexities of modern life. Let Seneca's wisdom guide us toward a life of virtue, a life guided by right reason, and a life that, in its very essence, embodies the highest good. Seneca, though himself a wealthy man, was known for his untraditional views on wealth and happiness. Contrary to the common notion that equates wealth with happiness, Seneca saw virtue and wisdom as the true sources of happiness. He profoundly said, No man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity, for he is not permitted to prove himself. This statement, rich in meaning, invites us to rethink our perception of wealth, happiness, and the role adversity plays in our lives. At first glance, this quote might seem counterintuitive. After all, don't we all aspire to lead lives free from hardship and adversity? Yet, Seneca insists that a life untouched by adversity leaves us unhappy and unfulfilled. So what does he mean? 
Seneca's philosophy highlights that adversity is a catalyst for growth and self-realization. Without adversity, we are not granted the opportunity to test our resilience, to discover our strengths, and to realize our potential. In essence, it is through overcoming challenges that we truly come to understand ourselves and our capabilities. This self-realization, this growth born out of struggle, is where true happiness lies. The pursuit of wealth, on the other hand, often leads us away from this path of self-realization. Wealth can provide comfort and security, but it can also lead to complacency, indulgence, and a sense of entitlement. When we're cushioned by wealth, we might miss the opportunity to test our mettle, to learn, grow, and prove our worth. How can we apply Seneca's teachings to redefine our concepts of wealth and happiness in our modern context? Firstly, Seneca's wisdom encourages us to embrace adversity rather than avoid it. When we face a challenge, instead of seeing it as an obstacle, we can view it as an opportunity to grow and learn. It's about adopting a resilient mindset, a perspective that sees adversity as a stepping stone towards self-improvement. Secondly, we should strive to balance our pursuit of wealth with the cultivation of virtue and wisdom. It's not about rejecting wealth outright, but about ensuring that our quest for material success doesn't overshadow our moral and personal growth. Thirdly, Seneca reminds us that true wealth isn't just about accumulating material possessions. It's about cultivating a rich inner life filled with virtue, wisdom, resilience, and self-realization. In other words, the wealthiest person is not necessarily the one with the most possessions, but the one who has developed a strong character and found peace within themselves. Lastly, Seneca's teachings guide us toward a more nuanced understanding of happiness. Happiness isn't merely the absence of adversity. It's about finding fulfillment and growth amidst life's challenges. It's about embracing life in all its ups and downs and finding joy in the journey of self-discovery. Seneca's perspective on wealth and happiness offers us a much-needed alternative to the materialistic worldview prevalent in our society. It encourages us to seek out the true riches of life, wisdom, virtue, resilience, and self-realization. Let us heed Seneca's wisdom and strive for a life that balances material wealth with inner richness, a life that finds happiness not in the absence of adversity, but in the ability to navigate it with grace, strength, and wisdom. One of the core principles of Stoicism is living in harmony with nature, an idea powerfully encapsulated by Seneca's words, God is near you, he is with you, he is within you. To fully understand the depth of this statement, we need to delve into Stoic philosophy's interpretation of God and nature. In Stoicism, God is often synonymous with nature or the universe, the rational principle that governs the world. Thus, Seneca's quote suggests that we carry within us a spark of the divine, the universal reason, or the logos. Therefore, living in harmony with nature means aligning ourselves with this inherent rationality and the world's natural laws. We must first recognize the inherent rationality within us as part of nature. We possess the capability of reason, a feature that distinguishes humans. This rationality allows us to discern, understand, and conform to the natural order of things. Therefore, living in harmony with nature involves using our reason to make thoughtful decisions, to differentiate between right and wrong, and to navigate life's challenges. Furthermore, Seneca's quote also prompts us to accept the natural order of the universe. Just like nature has its cycles of birth, growth, decay, and death, so do our lives embody these phases. By understanding and accepting this, we learn to navigate the ebb and flow of life, finding peace in the impermanence of things and appreciating the present moment. In addition, 
Living in harmony with nature means recognizing our interconnectedness with others and the world at large. Just as the elements in nature coexist in a delicate balance, we are part of a broader community of fellow humans, other creatures, and the environment. Therefore, living in accordance with nature requires fostering healthy relationships, contributing positively to our communities, and treating our environment with respect. Lastly, Seneca's words remind us of the divine presence within us, the essence of our true nature. By aligning our actions with our rational nature and universal principles, we honor this inner divinity, leading a life of integrity, virtue, and inner peace. In essence, Seneca's teachings on living in harmony with nature offer a blueprint for a fulfilling life. It encourages us to embrace our rationality, to accept life's natural rhythms, and to acknowledge our interconnectedness with the universe. As we strive to live in accordance with these principles, we draw closer to our truest selves, leading lives of greater wisdom, virtue, and inner harmony. In his writings, Seneca often talked about how important self-discipline is for living a good life. One of his most famous quotes, It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more, that is poor, sums up this idea beautifully. To begin, it's important to understand what Seneca means by craving more. This word refers to unchecked wants and needs, like an insatiable need for more money, power, or pleasure. The lack of self-discipline and lack of contentment makes us always seeking the next source of pleasure. Mastering self-discipline, then, means controlling these cravings. It means developing a sense of contentment, learning to value what we have, and managing our wants in a way that is in line with virtue and reason. Being self-aware and reflecting on our reasons for wanting things helps us figure out when our cravings are taking over. Once we know what our wants are, we need to think about whether they make sense and are in line with our values and ideas about what is important in life or whether they are just making us want more. This review process shouldn't be seen as a one-time thing, but as something that we should do all the time. It's about constantly thinking about our wants, judging how realistic they are, and changing how we act based on that. It's a way of constantly looking at ourselves and making ourselves better. Last but not least, we need to do something to control our cravings. This could mean setting limits, making healthy habits, and getting help when we need it. The goal is to live a life that is not controlled by cravings, but by reason and virtue. The wisdom of Seneca on self-discipline serves as a powerful reminder that true wealth lies not in having more, but in desiring less. It is about finding contentment in what we have and mastering our desires through self-discipline. What does this stoic perspective on death mean and how can it affect our understanding of life and mortality? Seneca, like many other Stoic philosophers, frequently explored the subject of death, imbuing it with a profound sense of acceptance and tranquility. To understand Seneca's point of view, we must first understand the Stoic idea of amor fati, or love of one's fate. Stoics teach us to accept and embrace all parts of life, including its end. They say that death, like birth, is a natural part of life, and something to be acknowledged rather than feared. His quote, then, is an acceptance statement. It shows death not as a scary end, but as a release, a final relaxation from the troubles and stresses of life. This view wasn't formed because of pessimism or a lack of interest in life. Instead, it comes from a deep understanding that all parts of life, including pain and suffering, are temporary and death is the natural end to these experiences. This view on death changes how we see and live our lives. It encourages us to live each day fully aware of our mortality, which can make our lives more meaningful and focused. Seneca's view tells us not to be afraid of death because it says that death is not a disaster, 
but a natural, unavoidable event. If we accept death, we can get rid of our fear and live more freely and bravely. It also helps us understand that every moment we have is a gift and should be used wisely. His teachings on death tell us to think about our own deaths on a regular basis. Doing this can help us deal with life's problems better, value our lives more, and set priorities based on what's really important. It's about changing our minds so that we see death not as the end, but as an important part of our lives. Let us approach life with an acceptance of death, not with fear, but with understanding, not with avoidance, but with awareness, so that we can free ourselves from the fear of death and live life more fully, courageously, and meaningfully. Seneca's views on death challenge the common narrative that portrays death as the ultimate enemy. Instead, they invite you to see death as a natural part of life's journey, a final release from life's challenges, and a return to the tranquility that existed before birth. Seneca's words give us peace and a new way of looking at things. They tell us that we can face death, the end of our lives, with the same calm acceptance and understanding that we use to face life. There are more things, Lucilius, likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more often in imagination than in reality, according to Seneca's timeless wisdom. This is especially true in today's uncertain world. Before we can get into this lesson, we need to realize that fear and anxiety live in our thoughts and aren't always related to the present. When we worry, we're usually thinking about what might happen in the future or feeling bad about things we did in the past, neither of which we can change in the present. This thinking about the past or the future is what makes us anxious and afraid, according to Seneca. Next, Seneca tells us to tell the difference between what we can control and what we can't. This is an important part of Stoic philosophy. When we realize that many things we worry about are out of our hands, like most of the things that might happen in the future, we can start to let go of our anxiety and focus our energy on things we can change. Mindfulness and being aware of the present moment are powerful tools that can help you. When we are fully present, we ground ourselves in reality and are less likely to project our fears into an imagined future or dwell on regrets from the past. Mindfulness lets us see things as they are, not as we fear they might be. Additionally, logical thinking can help us deal with fear and anxiety. Seneca and the Stoics both say that we should use reason to question our fears. Are they logical? Are they based in reality? Or are they just made up in our minds? When we question our fears and worries, we often find that they are based on unlikely scenarios or overblown outcomes. Acceptance is also very important. In this case, acceptance means recognizing our fears and anxieties without judging them and then letting them exist without letting them control our actions and decisions. It means realizing that these feelings are normal human responses, but don't define us or our reality. Seneca's advice essentially encourages us to look at our worries and fears with a logical and present-focused mindset. He tells us that our worries often come from dwelling on the past or the future, and that the power to get rid of them lies in the present. With this wisdom in mind, let's try to stay present, think logically, and accept without judgment as we make our way through life. These are the best ways to get over fear and anxiety. A beautiful quote by Seneca says, We must go for walks outside so that the mind can be strengthened and invigorated by a clear sky and plenty of fresh air. This idea of traveling as a cure for the soul may sound like a modern self-help tip, but it comes from ancient Stoic philosophy. Seneca told us to go outside and take walks, but what did he mean by this? How can we apply this to our lives? At its core, Seneca's advice is to leave our routines and familiar places 
and open ourselves up to new experiences, scenes, and points of view. Seneca thought that travel wasn't about luxury or escape. It was about personal growth, self-reflection, and mental renewal. It's important to note that Seneca wasn't just talking about physical travel, that is, getting from one place to another on foot or some other way. He was also talking about the journey we take inside ourselves when we leave our comfort zone, the insights and clarity we gain when we give our minds a break. Applying this lesson practically, we can try to change our environment on a regular basis, whether it's by going for a walk in the park, a hike in the woods, or a trip to a different city or country. These activities give us the clear sky and fresh air that Seneca talks about, which helps our minds grow, relax, and open up new vistas. Moving isn't the only thing that matters, though. Being fully present and involved during these trips is also important. That way, we can fully absorb the surroundings and experiences and let them shape our thoughts and ideas. Traveling in this way also makes us think about ourselves. When we meet new people, see new places, or experience new cultures, we often find hidden parts of ourselves that we don't see in our daily lives. This kind of thinking about ourselves can help us become more self-aware and understand our values and beliefs better. Also, in today's busy world, our minds are often full of information and other things that confuse us. Getting away from these things by going to a different place can give our minds a much-needed break and give us space to think more clearly and artistically. Seneca's advice on travel is a reminder that we need to take mental and physical breaks from our daily lives. It stresses that these breaks, these travels, are good for our souls and minds and should be done. It's a call to go outside, not just to see what's around us, but also to start an inner journey of self-discovery, growth, and clarity. So let's take his advice and look for clear skies and fresh air. Let's travel, not just as a way to get from one place to another, but as a way to heal our souls, learn more about ourselves, and get our minds stronger and more alert. By reading Seneca's Letters from a Stoic, we've found deep wisdom from one of the most important Stoic philosophers. We've looked at 11 key lessons from his timeless collection of letters, and each one has helped us learn more about life, relationships, virtue, and our own minds. We began our journey navigating through life's hardships, understanding that adversity is not a cruel impediment, but a tool for self-discovery and a catalyst for personal growth. The lessons we've explored are not only relevant, but incredibly practical, touching on areas of life that we all deal with on a daily basis. We looked into how time changes quickly and learned from Seneca's urgent call to embrace the present. This lesson reminds us to value the now, the moment we have full control over. Next, we looked into the complex parts of friendships and relationships and found that understanding and being understood is at the heart of a true bond. We looked at Seneca's guide to peace of mind and his teachings on anger management, emphasizing how anger can make us feel helpless and how important it is to keep our emotions in check. This idea is at the heart of Seneca's ethics and the ethics of all Stoics. To understand that adversity is a necessary part of personal growth, we looked into Seneca's ideas about wealth and happiness. Next, we talked about living in harmony with nature, which is a central idea in Stoic thought and means understanding the flow of life. We talked about how important it is to be self-disciplined and in charge of your wants, based on the wisdom that wanting more is what makes you poor. We also looked at Seneca's ideas on death, which are often met with fear and uncertainty, and found a sense of peace and acceptance in them. We looked at fear and anxiety with a critical eye, cutting them up with the scalpel of rational thought and present moment awareness. Finally, we let Seneca's ideas about travel wander through our minds, 
realizing that travel is a journey of the soul that refreshes the mind and opens up new perspectives. These lessons, which come from the depth of Stoicism, give us a way to find our way through life's many challenges. But these insights and knowledge will only help us if we use them in our daily lives. Reading and understanding them are only the first steps. The real journey starts when we let them guide our actions, decisions, and points of view. Let's try to apply the essence of Stoicism in our daily lives, cultivating virtue, accepting what is beyond our control, and navigating life's ups and downs with wisdom and resilience. The wisdom from letters from a Stoic is not a prescription, but a guide, inviting us to look at life through the lens of Stoicism, enabling us to live lives of purpose, tranquility, and profound understanding. Each day offers us the chance to put these lessons into practice, and it is through these small daily actions that we truly honor Seneca's legacy and enrich our own lives in the process.